broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona. It's time for Valley Business Radio, spotlighting the Valley's best businesses and the people who lead them. Hello and welcome to Valley Business Radio, where we tell the stories that traditional media tends to ignore and help connect you to the right people. I'm your host, Dr. Adrian McIntyre, and I'm excited for our conversation today. This is a little bit different than our usual focus on local businesses, companies, and nonprofits. We're dealing with an issue that has a deep resonance and concern to the business community. We're talking about immigration and the DACA program, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. This is a program that has offered temporary protection from deportation and the ability to work legally to more than 700,000 young immigrants. It's currently on the docket for the Supreme Court to review the status of this law. In 2017, the Trump administration announced that the government was terminating the program. There have been multiple challenges to that decision. And this is an issue that deeply affects the business community. This is not a political show. As we often say here at Business Radio X, some media leans left, some media leans right. We lean business but we are deeply concerned about the human aspect of our communities, our state, our legislature, and of course, the companies and businesses that are operating here in Arizona. I'm joined for this conversation by Ellie Perez, who is a DACA recipient. Welcome, Ellie. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And also Dr. Ann Hart, educational consultant with the Heart of Education. Welcome, Dr. Hart. Thank you. Steve Zylstra is president and CEO of the Arizona Technology Council. Steve, it's good to see you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Now, this issue touches so many families and so many businesses in so many ways. It's sometimes overwhelming to wrap our heads around the legislative dimensions, the personal dimensions. Ellie, let's have a conversation with you to kind of bring us into this world. Can you share with us a little bit about your own background? And we'll use that as a way to begin understanding the larger issues. Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Thank you um, for joining us. Uh, so my name is Ellie Perez. I was born in Jalapa, Veracruz, Mexico. I came to this country when I was about four years old. Um, and when I was 16, I found out I was undocumented. And at the age of 16, being undocumented doesn't really mean much other than you can't work at the mall with your friends and you can't get your driver's permit. Uh, when I graduated high school, I remember standing on that field after we'd sang the national anthem with my choir, after we've gotten our diplomas and realizing what that truly meant. It meant that my opportunities and my aspirations of being a trauma nurse at County Hospital were gone. It meant that I was never going to be able to own my own home. It meant that I was never going to be able to give back to my community. And I grew up in public schools and public education really taught me that you give back to your community, right? Whatever they give you, you give back in tenfold. And so when I found out it was undocumented, it was this moment where I felt angry. I felt upset. But most of all, I felt betrayed because my entire life I'd grown up thinking that the American dream was possible. The only thing people forgot was that it was only possible if you were born on this side of the border or if your parents had come here legally, which I had no control over. I was four years old. So I started organizing. And now it's 2019. I um, received my DACA permit, which has allowed me to live my life in two year spans. So I don't get to have a five year plan. I get a two year plan. And in two years, I have to make sure that I am financially stable in case DACA goes away, that I'm financially stable enough to take care of my mother, to take care of my family, that I'm financially stable enough to be able to support myself if my permit goes away or is taken away. So this November, in a few days, actually, the Supreme Court's going to be hearing arguments on whether or not people like me can keep our permits, whether or not young Americans, 800,000 of us can stay in the country, continue to legally work give to Social Security, pay taxes, be business owners, be lawyers, be doctors, be teachers. And, you know, we're hoping for the best. uh, But we know that this is going to be an issue that we're going to have to continue organizing around. You you really uh, eloquently described a lot of different aspects of this issue. And I want to zero in for a minute on one aspect of this. And that is the moment that you learned that you were in fact undocumented and and started to grapple with the significance of that. And here's why I think it's important, Ellie, to, to, to look at that moment. There are many other people who in the course of their lives discover things they didn't know about their personal history, about their identity. 
It happens uh, when young people who are adopted and didn't learn they were adopted until they were older have to grapple with this sense of betrayal, identity, confusion, who am I anyway kind of a thing. My own cousin, who's like a brother to me, uh, although he knew from an early age he was adopted, has kind of had to grapple with this issue. And I know this touches a lot of folks. People who now are participating in the proliferation of DNA testing are discovering secrets about their families that they didn't know. I know somebody who discovered that the person she thought was her older sister was actually her mother and that the family had kept that secret from her her whole life. She's now in her 50s. So this is not a uniquely immigrant story. It's a uniquely human story. Can you share with us a little bit about what happened in that moment, what it was like for you, how you began to wrap your head around that? I mean, I know that there's a lot of parents out there, right, who uh, send their kids to school. So I was in high school when it happened. I was 16. And I remember the exact classroom I was in. And I remember the exact teacher who was proctoring the, those darn uh, Ames tests. I remember there was a section that said, you know, put your last four of your social security number. And I raised my hand out loud in my class. And I said, well, what if you don't have a social security number? To this day, I remember my teacher's look on her face. Her eyebrows shot up so far they hit the ceiling. And she said, well, you should talk to your parents about that. I went and I asked my mom, hey, I need my social security number. We're doing a test. You know, it's it's just to, to keep track. She said, well, here's the thing. You don't have one. And she, it was a very nonchalant conversation. And I said, well, what do you mean? You know, everybody has one. I often make the joke. It's like a belly button. You know, you don't know what it's for, but you're going to use it at some point. And this is the point where I was going to use it. And that's when she said, well, when you come over here, with no papers, you don't get one. And at 16, you know, it was just, okay, well, I don't have a social security number and I can't work with my friend. Um, when it really started to hit me was when my friends were applying for college, when my friends were filling out FAFSA forms, when my friends were talking about the very next day after our graduation, some of them were leaving to go to their college campuses. And the next day after I graduated high school, I, you know, picked up a broom and a mop and I became a house cleaner. And that was what my life was going to be like. And it was this moment where I just, I felt like there was no hope. And everything that I'd learned in school that get an education, go to school, be a good kid, be a good community person. It didn't matter because of where I was born. I had grown up as an American. I had lived my life as an American. And to this day, I am an American. The only difference between me and everybody else at this table is I got my social security number 25 years after you did <laughs> or after, right. after birth, right? <laughs> right. Dr. Ann Hart, you spent a lot of years working for the Department of Education. You have deep insight into many dimensions that touch on this issue. But I'm curious, kind of bridging off of Ellie's personal story, it sounds like school is the place where a lot of these things show up. Um, in terms of access to resources, of course, uh, everyone within the state is entitled to seek resources from our public schools. But can you speak a little bit to some of the broader issues at play here and how our educational system, the public school system, the Department of Education and helps students navigate or, or struggles to help students navigate? What's at stake? So, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you. Again, I'm Ann Hart, and I've spent most of my career between government and education. And it's always been a primary concern of mine personally. My passion has been education. And there are a couple things that could and should have happened to secure the education and prosperity for um, each individual's, um, you know, future in the, in the world of education. And I think there are a few things that were absent. Whenever a student is admitted to the education system, you've already taken an opportunity to invest in their security and their education. Once they're in the doors of public education and public law, we're all entitled to be educated. And once that education journey begins, there should be a, a system in place. And I don't know that it ever has been because otherwise Ellie would have never gone to age 16 and, and, and not known she didn't have a Social Security card. If you don't have a social security number and you're and you're allowed to be provided free and appropriate education as entitled by the education amendment, then those students should have been protected. Any student that's in this country, any student that's in a school should be protected. So the resources that should have been available were not. 
because you have students in LA situation as well who have tested and have taken exams or on their way to college and accepted scholarships and have and have um, um, schools identified for their future. And that has been snatched from them because of this recent law and information and pending outcome of it all. It's very unfair. So this is a problem that I believe where a gap developed. Okay, we dropped the ball educationally. The Department of Education provides all the supplemental resources and extra tools to make sure that a student's entitled to education and is able to learn and have those resources. But what security does that individual have? How does that make that person feel that knows that it's doubtful whether I'm going to continue, whether I'm going to finish? Like you said, you had to pick up an, another um, career, so to speak, temporarily, not knowing what your future would have been. So what I want to do to say to address this, we have to put systems in place that protect our students from preschool. Once they enter the education system, they should be secured and locked in and follow a pipeline of hopeful and anticipatory and secure educational outcomes without having them to have themselves removed from our society. Because that creates another issue that impacts economics and impacts civic engagement, social and the whole learning process through socialization that's providing the education process. Mm. You mentioned such an important concept there, which is the idea of security. This is a multifaceted issue. A lot of people tend to think of security in terms of personal security or securing our borders. Outside of the United States, uh, the concept of human security is a very important theme under which protections for vulnerable populations, women, children, refugees, internally displaced people, economic security is being discussed. It's an extension of conversations about human rights. Human rights are are important. They're the legal framework through which uh, all of these protections are in place. But it's the human security that is the point, because uh, having lived and worked in over 30 countries around the world, including many very insecure environments, when people don't have that basic sense of, of wholeness, wellness, well-being, when they are insecure, they're living in fear, they're exposed to violence, sexual violence, uh, you know, other forms of violence, economic violence, it, it has an impact on everybody. So the conversation that fascinates me is why we can't find ways together to deal with the broader question of our human security. We're all in the same boat. There's no saying, well, there's no hole in my side of the boat because it has effects. These issues reach into all kinds of aspects of our everyday life. And unfortunately, the hardening of our politicalized, uh, you know, ideology around this, I think, has lost some of that. Let's talk about. You know, it has to be. You're absolutely correct. In, in my opinion, it has to be built into the infrastructure of the educational institutions. And so when an, in, an institution is organizing different opportunities and tracks, you have ELL education, you have uh, bilingual education and, and different tracks that, that center into a person or an individual's expertise or needs of study. And if you don't have someone who's looking out for um, – population, special populations of people and persons. It's not just the, the students that are come here undocumented because every student that enters the education process should be documented. And it's, if you look at the tier of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that's what I'm speaking of when I say security. You get to each little level of life and you feel comfortable with it and you've succeeded in that area because all the facets that surround your growth and your existence in this world through education, other opportunities that education gives you. Being in a school setting provides other pipelines to be able to enjoy, as you say, the American dream. And so the security is not built into the infrastructure so that students and families who are concerned and do not have that documentation security, they, um, it's, it's eliminated. And it should be infused into the network, and it isn't. I think it's important in, in this conversation to acknowledge the fact that we're also not just talking about young people. We're talking about students and teachers. We're talking about staff. We're talking about people in the ancillary services that are providing important resources to the education system. And even the education system itself is just one major component of this 
Of course, the issue touches on uh, the economic and social and cultural environment in which we're all trying to live and work uh, and, in theory anyway, pursue life, liberty, and happiness and all those other wonderful things. Steve Zoustra, let's talk a little bit about the economic and business implications of this. Because there is a significant amount of participation in both the economy and the workforce at stake here. As president and CEO of the Arizona Technology Council, you certainly see this through the lens of technology, but there's, of course, many other types of of business entities, small businesses, entrepreneurial ventures, things of that nature that are impacted by immigration. How does this issue resonate with you? What are you seeing through through your uh, position with the Arizona Tech Council? Well, first of all, it's unfair. It's unfair to these children who entered this country at a young age, uh, and it wasn't uh, of their own doing. And uh, suddenly um, are, you know, at the verge of potential deportation if the Supreme Court um, decides this the wrong way. But um, it's important to me as the head of the Arizona Tech Council, I represent over 800 uh, member companies across the state in various uh, technology verticals. And a lot of people don't realize that almost 30% of the um, DACA um, recipients here in Arizona, which there are over 30,000, almost 30% of them are in the electronic component and product manufacturing industry. That's our industry, my industry. Um, that's the tech industry. So um, many of these folks have uh, worked in jobs in these companies for, for decades. Um, they've lived here for decades. And, uh, you know, they know no other place uh, than the United States. Either they were too young to remember uh, or whatever. And um, it's just unfair. And it has a huge economic impact. I think I've seen data that suggests that um, if the Supreme Court decision goes the wrong way, it could have a up to a $360 billion impact on the, on the U.S. economy. And that's probably an underestimate. You mentioned the role in manufacturing. I think this is really important because there is a tendency shaped by prejudice and, and racial assumptions to think this affects landscapers uh, you know, s- small, you know, carniceria owners, things of that nature. The, the employment of immigrants in the state of Arizona touches every sector, including some of our biggest companies and our leading technology uh, producers. So this is not just a, oh, you know, those people in the barrio are going to be affected by this. It doesn't bother us. No, in fact, um, at a time when we have um, a very robust economic situation where Uh, None of our members are able to find uh, enough talent uh, to fill the demand. Uh, I can't imagine uh, if suddenly these um, people are ripped out of their home country, uh, the United States, and sent back to the country from which they originally came from. It would have a huge and dramatic impact on Arizona's economy and, uh, for me, Arizona's uh, tech sector. Now. Ellie, at the beginning of this conversation, you mentioned a variety of ways that immigrants in general, but DACA recipients in particular, are in fact contributing. Uh, You talked about uh, taxes. You talked about, uh, you know, um, employment, things of that nature. Let's let's get into some of those details, because, again, when when Steve talks about being ripped out, I think it's important to realize the degree to which we're all embedded in this fabric of our collective social and economic life. We're unequally situated in that, to be sure. But can you speak to some of the ways in which you see DACA recipients and immigrants more generally, although obviously the the DACA program is the one on the chopping block here, uh, contributing to yeah. the economic and social environment? Absolutely. So I, I'm very lucky uh, in, in, in my line of work, I get to interact with a lot of DACA recipients who, you know, there are some who are small business owners. There are some who do a landscaping job. There are some who are bankers. And there are some that are teachers and doctors and some that want to serve in our military. There are some that have helped 
communities vote. And I think that's the biggest impact that DACA recipients have. I mean, these are your neighbors. These are your your classmates, again, your teachers. And, and I keep going back to teachers because what we're seeing in Arizona is we have a shortage of educators and you're going to rip away people who are qualified, who have gone to school to teach your children, who all they want to do is teach the next generation. And you're telling them that they are not American enough to your standards and that they don't deserve to be here. And so I think that's the biggest um, factor when, when it comes to how we contribute. But also in the small business sector, there are so many DACA recipients who had to find a way, right, how the kids say to hustle because we couldn't work a legal way. So we had to find ways to start our own businesses. I've seen many who have started consulting uh, businesses who have started businesses where they use their talents to teach people. Uh, we have one of our DACA recipients in Arizona was on the Forbes top 40 list for starting a nonprofit that teaches people to deal with trauma out of her own trauma. This came about. And this is not just for undocumented people. This helps her community. And so I think those are the stories that we need to highlight. Um, we need to remind people that it's not just the landscaper in Sunny Slope that's going to get deported. Right. It's not just the banker who lives in Arcadia that's going to get reported. These are your neighbors. We are a community. I said this earlier today, when you thrive and your neighbor thrives, our entire community thrives. And so the question should always be, how am I being a good American? Right. The, the most American thing is to help your neighbor and to stand up for those who don't have a voice. And so I think that's something that we need to continue that conversation as well. Well, certainly there's a longstanding tradition of that in this country. And unfortunately, there's also a longstanding tradition of fear, hatred, anti-immigrant perspectives. I mean, people, uh, <laughs> you know, they say if those who don't study history are condemned to, to repeat, repeat the mm-hmm. 11th grade. But um, <laughs> people fail to realize that this story has played out in this country before and that Italians, Greeks, Jews, uh, even the Irish were not considered mainstream. They were viewed at as as foreign invaders, a contagion, all of this horrific language, uh, which has played out over time. So we have these competing tendencies that, in my view, we all need to collectively grow up about. And we're struggling uh, in, in this current moment to to do that. Um, the The reality, the cold, hard economic realities of this, I believe, are important. Because I don't think that's what the that most people with an opinion about this issue are thinking about. The sales tax revenues generated by this population who... I, I, I mean, just, just I don't want to interrupt, but please. like people say, you know, undocumented immigrants, they don't pay taxes. Why don't just go to the store and walk out without paying for things? We pay sales tax. We pay into a social security system. Me as a DACA recipient, I have now paid into social security since I received my permit in 2013. And I will not see a dime of that until, you know, I'm lucky enough that there is a pathway to citizenship. You know, our parents, our small business owners, they still have to pay taxes. Contrary to popular belief, undocumented immigrants do not get social uh, support or social programs. Like we cannot get food stamps. We cannot get WIC. We cannot get access to all these programs because newsflash, we need a social security number for that. And I think that's something that's a big part that plays into this myth that immigrants take, 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 and they don't give back. That's the opposite. We can't take, take, take because we don't have the identifying paperwork to do so. Sure. And, you know, there's there's um, there's an important issue here, which is I think it's possible to support the rule of law, to support the the pursuit of a, a legal system that provides appropriate protections and constraints, and at the same time be a passionate advocate yes. for human security. It's not an either or no. type thing. Uh, you mentioned Social Security, and it's unfortunate I can't remember the, the details of this article. I read it uh, over a year ago. But even people who are breaking the law by getting jobs with fake social security numbers, their employers are still paying mm-hmm. the, the, the social security w- into, into the federal, into the federal bank. pool yeah. where it gets used to continue to fund the system Absolutely. for our aging population who, for whom there was a lot of concern about, is, this, is there going to be enough? Is the social security money going to run out yeah. before the end of my life? Well, 
even though they are breaking the law, we should address that, find appropriate mechanisms, et cetera, et cetera. Let's have that conversation. Mm -hmm. Let's also look at the benefit that's currently happening. Absolutely. Their employers are still paying the money into the collective pot. When those funds are unclaimed, they get used for the for the general. I'm not. Yeah. A, the, the money just economist. doesn't disappear. It, it, it does get used. And just to add to something that else that's running out, we in Arizona, particularly, there's a report called Dropped. And so it talks about how Latino students, majorly undocumented uh, from undocumented parents, these students are being left behind in, in the school, in the school pipeline. Right. And so we have an aging population in Arizona. And I think we all know this. And there are not enough qualified people graduating to take care of that population. You you go in and you then cut down on people who are already qualified and your pool is reduced by so many more others. And so that's also something to take into account. Um, I'm going to let my colleagues speak, but I think also something that we need to address is that there is a, a system and it's broken. People have been in line for years to get a social security number, to get pathway to citizenship just from Mexico to the United States. And I think that's also a misconception that I'm happy to address once. Well, I just want to speak to the economic realities. Um, If uh, we were to pull uh, the DACA recipients from this state, it would have a $1.3 billion impact on our gross state product. In addition to that, uh, you talked about taxes, all kinds of DACA recipients pay all kinds of taxes, right? Mm-hmm. Sales tax, income tax, uh, yeah. Social Security tax. $270 million of our tax proceeds just in Arizona come from DACA recipients. So uh, this has a real economic impact. Uh, it also has um, a dramatic impact on the workforce at a time where we're really at full employment. We haven't seen this kind of um, full employment since probably the 60s. And uh, we can't find enough talent to fill the open positions in a whole range of fields from construction through aerospace. Mm -hmm. And uh, to pull that many workers uh, just is insane. Dr. Hart, the pathway in the traditional American dream, which was only the dream of some and only accessible to a smaller percentage yet, uh, has been uh, get a good education, go to college, uh, get a good job. Now, there, there's clearly, uh, that, that, as I say, that is a pathway that was more available to some than others. Uh, that has also changed quite significantly in the forget about politics, forget about social issues. The nature of work and what it means to have a meaningful career has exactly. changed significantly in the past 40 years. And, you know, aside from the most important part, because our economy is important financially, we need that. But we have to look at how we interact with one another. And, you know, even when you go to work and you're learning how to integrate into the expectations of a job, coming to work on time and and integrating and working alongside other people who don't look like you, because... This is one of the things that's very important, especially as we move ahead in our new millennium. Um, we Students don't look like one another, and education provides many facets. And DACA students and children and families and grandparents and all have to learn what it's like to integrate. Like you said, they're your neighbors. You have the cultural piece. You have the social piece. You have the engagement piece. And if we start to separate because of a, 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 a lack of paperwork being done 15, 20, 34 years ago, it leaves a gap into how we can utilize socialization in a positive manner that creates an limit and creates positivity and harmony and, you know, just atonement to the communities because what happens is that we don't see one another. We don't learn and sit beside one another in classrooms and higher institutions of learning. And it creates a big gap into the social entity, even in the workplace. You know, you can't succeed economically if you don't understand how to relate to one another socially, culturally, linguistically, psychologically, and utilize an empathy and apathy with one another and things that help you grow and to matriculate into this community. So the education piece, it should be things that are putting place how to keep everyone in this society and give opportunities for growth and education as opposed to trying to eliminate. 
there's a number of trends that I think are really interesting, uh, and and we'll get to those in just a minute. But Steve, I see you wanted to jump in and add something here. Yeah, um, it's around education. So um, I I just want to point out that this isn't only a federal issue, no. right? It's a state issue too. You may recall that the Arizona Board of Regents uh, decided to provide um, in-state tuition to DACA recipients. Um, but the court system overruled that. So, um, you know, there's another dysfunction and uh, inequality that we're experiencing just within the state of Arizona. So it's not just a federal issue. It's a local and a state issue as well. And, and, and just to add to that, I, you know, I was lucky enough to be one of those DACA recipients who was affected by their decision. I got my acceptance letter to ASU in January and then a few months later, I think it was May or June when the Board of Regents met again, they had decided that we got in-state tuition. My uh, tuition dropped down dramatically. I don't qualify for federal aid. I don't qualify for a lot of scholarships, right? They have to be privately funded. And so paying for school was really hard. Um, you know, I still have student debt that I can't pay off of loans. And it, just in that section, right, it just the border regions taking that really bold move and understanding that these individuals are going to give back to the community way more than what that tuition was, was a a huge win for us. But as you said, the courts are fighting it. Our attorney general continues to fight it. And it it just just doesn't make sense. Why are you fighting kids who want to learn and be better Arizonans? Yeah, it's a it's a major issue. And and it touches on all institutions of higher learning from, uh, you know, you you Arizona, as they're now called, to <laughs> Arizona State, with the largest public university in the country at yeah. this point, um, to um, uh, G, uh, completely bl- blank. NAU. Oh, the Antelopes. N- NAU. <laughs> and all our private universities. It wasn't <laughs> NAU I was blanking on. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then, of course, Maricopa Community Colleges District, Absolutely. the largest community colleges district in the country. Yep. So disproportionately impacted, I think, in some ways by this issue. Uh, and a few months ago, I was volunteering uh, at a at a day organized by an organization helping students, undocumented students, apply for scholarships, of which there are not a lot available. Mm-hmm. And I was blown away. I mean, I I taught at the University of California Berkeley for eleven years, both as a graduate student and then as a faculty member after completing my PhD. And I was telling these kids, you really have to understand. I know you you might think that you know your second you know, second class or something because, you know, of the environment in which you're in. But after spending a full day with them, going over their applications, writing their essays together, providing some coaching and advice, there's literally no difference between you and some of the brightest oh. minds at the top public universities in the country. So you know, what are we even doing out here? Like Absolutely. we should be making this sort of thing available. The The broader issue for higher education is really quite interesting because for 10 or 15 years, the mandate now has been shifting much more towards focusing on access and inclusion. So nearly every university, not access and inclusion, I apologize, access and retention. Nearly every public university or uh, private university in the country is trying to deal with making the student body on campus more reflective of the general population in which the university or college Mm -hmm. is located. Historically, they've not looked the same. You walk on campus and you see one type of student and you walk across the street to get lunch and you're in a whole other you know, in world. Right. So access means providing pathways for more people who don't look like traditional college students, which is a silly concept anyway. It was always a that was the minority mm-hmm. uh, to provide pathways to higher education and then retention, helping them be successful in completing their degree. Um, Obviously, the the issues for K-12 education are somewhat different because there's a federal mandate to provide that support, to provide access, to provide appropriate, I don't remember the language of PL-1120. Public Law 142. That's the one. (laughs) So, you know, the thing of it is, is this. It's good to have inclusion and retention is even more important, as you all know. But at, at the end of the day, who is there to hold your hand to make you feel valued? And to make you feel secure enough to say, I can do this. Because it's one thing to see a population of of, of a fabric of, you know, everyone that looks different. And I don't know if the retention, it truly reflects what is represented 
publicly and physically on the campuses of universities and even in schools, um, K-12 through schools, because it's hard for individuals to matriculate through education process and you don't have that counselor or that social worker or that faculty chair or that, you know, person that looks like you or feels and understands and and empathetic towards your needs to help you understand what you need to do because it's a struggle. And parents are not always in a point to advocate on behalf of their students, college or otherwise, because it's intimidating and the language is different and it's a comprehension and a language barrier. So you kind of like faltering around on your own. And I don't know what the retention rates are for the universities that have a high, you know, percentage of diverse students. But I do know there are transfers between large universities because um, students want to go to a place that they feel more comfortable in. When you get your degree at the end of the day or you get your vocational education certificate, what is going to be more meaningful? The, pl- the place. I mean, I, this is, I'm going to throw in my plug here for, for ASU. They, Dr. Crow and the entire ASU team has done an amazing job. And I, as an ASU graduate, I'm so proud to come from an organization and a school that values diversity and that it, it sounds so crazy that values me right? I wasn't just another And that's what's student. important. It, it's that they, they made us feel, and they made me feel like just a regular Arizona student. And it wasn't like, oh, you're a DACA recipient. Right. You know, they were like, no, you're just an Arizonan who chose to come to ASU and you're a Sun Devil for life. And so being embraced in that community and them going above and beyond, them even signing on to some of these briefs and saying, these are our students and we are going to fight for them because I know that they will fight for us. That means so much. By the way, uh, the data for ASU is just astonishing. Um, when Michael Crow came to ASU, less than one percent, or less than ten percent of the population of students were from diverse backgrounds. And it's close to fifty percent now. You walk uh, around that school, and it's and it's a oh, much it bigger it's institution. Like pot, so absolutely. it's 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 a huge number. I'm, I'm a Sun Devil graduate, right. so and, and, it's true. We all have experienced the same positive outcome at Arizona State University. And, Dr. Hart, you said something that that it really hits home. You said, you know, parents sometimes are not equipped to advocate for their children or their students. And that's absolutely right. Like my parents were undocumented, so they didn't speak the language and they didn't know what was going on. But then, you know, where I learned to advocate, I learned in Arizona public schools. I mean, you raised Americans. What do you think is going to happen? We're going to sit there and take it. No, we're going to take it to the streets and we're going to fight. And that's, you know, that's again, that shows just how we were raised. We were not raised with our parents' customs from their country. We were raised with American values. And so you want to talk about ripping Americans out of their home? Well, the last time they tried to do that, you know, a country was born. (laughs) (laughs) It's a very good point. I used to say for years that uh, for a country Uh, with with revolutionary (laughs) origins, we have become the most anti-revolutionary country in some way. Uh, it, and by the way, I need to correct myself. It was Grand Canyon University mm, that I was completely yeah. blanking on a few minutes ago in just one of those brain moments that we sometimes <laughs> have. Uh, my apologies to uh, to the leadership of GCU, uh, an important player in our scene and in, on the technology as well as uh, community side of things as well. Um, as we begin to wrap up this conversation, I obviously we're passionate about the issue. Uh, you know, at some level, maybe in talking to each other, we're preaching to the choir on this. Uh, the legislative uh, drama will unfold as the Supreme Court reviews this. Obviously, we collectively in this room uh, believe that renewing the, the, this law, not allowing the challenge to it to go through, makes sense for our businesses, makes sense for our state, makes sense for our institutions and so on. But what are some of the things that folks listening to this might need to do? or think, or, you know, what are some of the ways in which people um, who either want, they're undecided, they may still have some concerns and, and, and points of view. They want to try to, maybe they've been inspired by something that was said here and they want to take a fresh look at this. So either they want to learn more or they want to do something uh, to support either DACA recipients or to in some way, you know, organize their companies, their their small businesses, their community participation around this issue. Thoughts on that from our panel? Yeah. Please. So first of all, um, Congress could circumvent uh, the Supreme Court decision, correct? Yes. So we, we <laughs> should... They taught us in the eighth grade. Yeah. Yes. Checks and balances. <laughs> yes. And, and we should all be talking to our federal legislators. Um, 
because this is such a critical issue. I, I think it's 86% of Americans believe that DACA recipients um, should be able to go forward and become citizens, by the way, 86% of Americans. So the American population um, believes in this, and uh, they should all be talking to their congressmen and women about this issue. Also, we mentioned what's going on at the state level, right? So you need to be talking to your state legislator. You know, you have a voice with them. You should use that voice. And and um, like Ali, you should be an activist, right? You should get out there and you should talk to people. You should get on radio programs like this and talk about the issue because of the dramatic impact that it has, as Dr. Hart said, on people, right? This is about people. And uh, at the end of the day, there's all kinds of ways that people can get active, that can uh, give themselves voice with people that are in power and make these decisions. And we should all be heard. Um, So well said. And education is a civil right. It's a civil right. And we have, all of us have the opportunity, we're supposed to, for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. But more importantly, because I have spent many of my years statewide and countrywide advocating on behalf of issues that are going to provide equal justice and equity and equality in education as far back as it goes with board Brown versus the Board of Education. You know, this is where it all began. And even if we go back, you talk about immigrants, you talk about slavery being denied an opportunity to read. And so those are facets that are important. It's just, it just looks different now. It just has a different covering on the outside. But avocation is more important because we have to educate our parents, our grandparents, and, and people like you, Allie. It should be threefold because you can't do it all. You know, it becomes an elephant, but it has to be repetitive. It has to be something that's communicated and something that you said earlier, which I think is very important too, that show all the accomplishments, you know, mirror the things that have been done by a so-called population of young people who are so-called not allowed to be in here. We have to like check through, look through the microscope again to see if you're qualified. But you've already contributed. We've already done. We've made the money. You've made the impact. And and imagine what the people or students have done that can reach back and share and bring in others who are all, at the end of the day, it's all going, all going to benefit all of us. Elliot, just before you have the final say here, I want to acknowledge something important that you said a few minutes ago about learning self-advocacy and the unique position that you're in where it's not always your parents who can provide that for you because they're living with their own fears and concerns and trying to manage their own life and take care of things. It really is through engagement, peer-to-peer Uh, through taking advantage of programs and opportunities, through finding organizations who are playing an active role and and contributing some time, getting around other people who are passionate about these issues. Uh, That must be an important part in some way of learning what you can do with your voice and with your hands and with your commitment, with your heart. Absolutely. There there is something, you know, everyone says there's strength in numbers, but I have never felt more seen or more powerful than walking into a room full of accomplished young Americans who happen to have a DACA permit. And it is in those moments where I am so proud of my community and proud of who of the people who have built us up and the people who fight for us and have taught us how to fight. Um, You asked what people can do, you know, to get involved first, you know, Let's educate ourselves on what DACA is. It's not amnesty. It is a two-year permit from deportation, which means that for two years, I get to kind of drive home safely and, you know, not think about being deported. Um, DACA is is not a pathway to citizenship. There is no pathway yet. So like Steve said, we need to call our Congress people, call our senators, you know, Congress has passed many, many things and our Senate is sitting on it and not doing anything. Our lives are in limbo and the federal government is not doing their job. I don't know, you know, what kind of jobs other people who are listening have, but if I don't do my job, I get fired. Right. And Congress is not doing their job. So we need to start firing some people come next November if they're not, you know, doing their job. We need to get out there and have these conversations. And also, please don't be afraid to ask questions. It is okay if you don't know that the system is broken. I am happy to explain, right? There's many other DACA recipients who are happy to explain, but don't ever assume that 
we have it easy or we have it some kind of way because yes, I am undocumented, but I'm an Arizonan and I'm an American before everything else. And so from that, I take get civically involved. You know, if you've never voted before, this is the time to do it. Vote for your neighbors. Vote for the people who are depending on you. Vote for the people who are taking care of your children in school. You know, go out there, learn, register to vote, vote and demand that your elected officials respond to you in the way that you deserve to be responded to. Because at the end of the day, undocumented or documented, the people you send to the Capitol, either in Arizona, either in your local city council or at a federal level, they work for you. And they need to remember that if 86% of the country wants immigration reform and we are not getting it, we need to we need to hire new people. Yeah. And we need to ask ourselves kind of very simple political economy type questions about who benefits from the status quo uh, and why is there an unwillingness of our representatives to represent the interests of the people as opposed to those who are contributing funds to uh, to keep their thumb on the scale on certain issues. I mean, transparency and accountability are core principles of democracy. Yeah, and we should be demanding more insight and 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 clarity absolutely from those that we send to Washington. That's what this country is yeah. all about. That's what my 8th grade teacher absolutely uh, taught me about all those years. We, and we don't see that a lot. No, we we need to remind these politicians that our vote means way more than whatever dollars they're getting because at the end of the day our vote is the one that counts. Your vote as an American citizen and your duty is is to send them there and have them do their job. And so that counts more than any kind of dollars they get. Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges that we all face is activating an apathetic Mm -hmm. uh, uh, population. And, you know, one thing that's become increasingly clear to me, clouded though my sight is by my own privilege, is that privilege is invisible Mm -hmm. to those who have it and is is painfully obvious to those who don't. don't. So many of the issues that are being uh, voted on, debated, et cetera, the loudest voices in those conversations are people who are not participating in the issue at hand. Yep. Immigration is being decided by people who are immigrants eight generations ago. Not or who've never met an, a DACA recipient or a dreamer. D- top votes on women's reproductive health largely being decided by, by men, men <laughs> uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what, I, what I've appreciated about this conversation is that it doesn't fall into us versus them party politics, which is silly to the point of absurdity at this point. We got to look together as Americans at the issues that affect our lives. And I appreciate very much um, that uh, the call that Dr. Hart had for empathy. Empathy is a core human trait. Our ability to imagine ourselves in another person's situation to whatever degree that we can, limited though that may be, is at least the starting point of finding common ground. That's absolutely true. And I think that's what's lacking all through this whole infrastructure, the process. It is because it, you know, it only takes one to say, you know, hey, wait a minute. This is this one situation. This is one person here and we need to have more people. But, you know, you expressed it so well by saying, you know, when sometimes when you're in that point of privilege, you don't see or feel, but you have to be able to look and understand how someone else feels, you know, because it's, it's the voice that needs to be heard and the cry. And it's not asking for something free or asking for something that you're not entitled to. Um, and it, and it's, it's not anything that you're demanding mercy for. It's just the equal opportunity and equality and equity and the pursuit of living your life in America. Just a final note for me. Uh, DACA has been successful. Uh, it's, it's in spite of the fact that it's before the Supreme Court now. Four courts have decided in favor of DACA. It, is, it has been an excellent program. People have gone uh, up the scale, if you will, in terms of wage earning as a, as a consequence of DACA and, and contributed even more to society and more to our economy. It works. It's not unconstitutional. No one has ever said it was. And if it does get to the Supreme Court, they need to do the right thing. Well, they'll have that chance coming up uh, in next week. That's right. The 12th, I think. Yeah, it is 12th. As uh, as it comes before the court. I want to thank our guests for providing their passion, their perspective, their deep insight into the situation. I hope that to the degree that we have opened up aspects of this issue that our audience may not have considered before, we've done our job here in providing an educational 
um, platform uh, for issues that affect our everyday lives here in yes. Arizona and in yeah. the you. United States of America. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much for being here. I want to thank Ellie Perez, DACA recipient, uh, Dr. Ann Hart, and Steve Zalstra, president of the Arizona Tech Council. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. For all of us here at Business Radio X, this is Dr. Adrian McIntyre, and we'll see you next time on Valley Business Radio. Yeah.